Welcome everybody to our second Women in IT call. I am very excited to host this on International Women's Day. It's fantastic to get everybody together and really validate and understand the universal struggles and, and challenges and successes that we have in you know a tech environment a work environment and in a social environment so today we have a couple fantastic speakers that that are going to be joining us to kind of talk about their journey in the tech environment how they got to where they are a lot of us the the path to where we are right now was not a straight line uh we've we've taken a lot of different journeys and um you know where we started wasn't necessarily where we anticipated being right now but you know this this environment this tech environment that we're in really needs our our influence and our help so listening to everybody talk about the the similar routes that they took to to get to where they're at right now is is really interesting international women's day they they have a theme every year and this year the theme is embrace equity so what they mean by embracing equity is to willingly and enthusiastically accept and adopt the understanding that each person has different circumstances that we must allocate specific resources and opportunities needed to reach an equal outcome and you know this this really resonates with me because we are all in different places in our life. We all have different experiences. We all have different uh, environmental factors and, and emotional factors that affect what we do every day. And as a business entity, being able to understand where people are coming from and meet them and meet those needs is, is really important and really vital to having a successful and thriving business. So, um, you know, just being able to embrace that that equity and that understanding that we all do start and have different uh, different needs um, and meeting those needs is really important. So the fact that International Women's Day is highlighting that is really just a fantastic uh, call out for them. So this morning, as I said, we've got some amazing speakers that are going to be uh, joining us. First up is Lana Soche. Um, she is the Avanti Data Protection Officer. And we also have Shelly Wright with us this morning, who is a Senior Director, PMO, and Corporate Strategy for Avanti. So I'm really excited to, to have these ladies with us today and have a, a little bit of chat and get a little bit of more understanding of how they got to where they are today, some of the struggles that, that they've had and how they've overcome those. So I think that this is going to be a really great conversation. So welcome to both of you. Lana, if if you could kind of introduce yourself and, and tell us what it is that you do with Avanti to just kind of give us a highlight. Um, I am Lana Sauche and I am Avanti's data protection officer. And what I do is make sure that Avanti is handling personal data, specifically personal data. Um, appropriately and according to uh, relevant privacy laws and regulations. You know, it's a little different from security where security does all types of data, including non-personal data. And so my focus really is on um, just the personal data. So what are what are two or three facts about your your day to day role that that some people might be surprised of? Um, I don't think that most people realize how much research uh, um, privacy requires. Um, I spend a lot of time reading um, lots of lots of different types of information. Um, and that's the other thing that uh, I think people don't realize is the breadth of privacy. So I'm reading about regulations, I'm reading about technologies, I'm reading about um, social movements and how they're using them. I, I'm reading about children and their rights and um, and I and current events because they all impact the way uh, personal data is consumed and handled. And then I think another um, really surprising aspect for many of the people here at, at Avanti, and sometimes even with our partners and customers, is that I'm actually concerned about employee data as well. There's an automatic assumption that my job revolves around 
customer data. And, and while that is a massive part of my responsibility, it is um, just as important as, as protecting our, our employees' data. Excellent. Thank you very much. Shelly, same question to you. Give us give us a little intro into your role at Avanti and what are a, a couple things that you do during your day that most people would be surprised at? I am really excited to be here today with everyone on such a special day. So thank you for having me. Um, my role at Avanti is Senior Director of the Program Management Office and Corporate Strategy overall. Those are really big, fancy words for basically meaning I'm a skeleton key, a complex problem solver, a passionate learner. I'm a people and service focused leader who really attests, assesses tools, technologies, problems, gaps, needs, and pulls together uh, the different teams across IT, across engineering, across different internal business units to invoke change, uh, to bring about enablement, to bring about digital transformation. And a couple of fun facts about my day-to-day -day is I absolutely love what I do because of two things. I love innovation and technology, and I love being stuck in the middle with amazing teammates and people and bringing about positive change in my little sphere, right? I, I don't influence the world. I'm not gonna solve world hunger, but I bring about change to help improve uh, processes and procedures by working with great people. Yeah, and that's that's an absolutely awesome point to make is, you know, we we want to change the world, but sometimes the best way to do that is to really focus on on our circle of influence and make that, you know, the most positive and and sound place that we can, um, because that that carries out that has a, a fantastic ripple effect. So that's a great point. Shelly, what what you know, how did you start in your career? Where where did you start at and how did you get to where you are right now? I was giggling when you were talking about taking the long way around uh, into IT. Mm -hmm. I actually started with the thought that I might be a doctor. Turns out I'm a little squeamish. <laughs> 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 so clearly that didn't work out for me. Um, but while I was working through college uh, in um, data entry, of all things, back in the day where there are service catalogs and basically people ordered through mail order, um, I would actually key in those uh, orders. And yes, hair dye is a wonderful thing. <laughs> um, I ran across a role to start doing coding and it was an entry level position. I took it and I found out that I liked inventing. It was sort of creative. I don't draw, I don't paint, I, I have no singing ability, but I can create using technology. And that sort of led me down a, a circular path where I was able to move into IT, move into project management, where I help partner with different people and learn from different people to deliver. And then when we're done, I get to go move on to something else that's new and interesting. And so it's always fresh, it's always different. And that's kind of how I started and how I sort of navigated into where I am today. It was just following my passion and what looked interesting to me. Yeah, you know, you you don't think that, that IT is a creative realm, but really it is. You're creating so many different things there. It, it's definitely, um, it, it can be an art form. So, yeah, that's that's a fantastic point. How about you, Lana? How did how did you start, and how did you get to where you are today? Well, I, I think I have kind of a funny story. Um, so, how I got into the IT world and and privacy world is actually by sheer accident. It was an inappropriate disclosure of data. Um, I was actually in the process of leaving a company and um, several months back, um, I had done a video interview. 
And that video was sent as part of a candidate um, roster to our CIO at the time he was looking for an assistant. And um, my video was included by accident. I did not apply for the job. It should not have been part of the candidate uh, portfolio that he was receiving. And so the HR department called me and told me that they had inappropriately disclosed my data, um, but that the CIO wanted to meet with me anyways. And so if I was interested <laughs> and I said, well, okay. <laughs> and, um, and I got the job as, as the CIO's assistant. And that is when I was introduced to the world of IT. Um, about a month into working for him, he said, oh, our CISO needs an assistant, so I volunteer you. So now you're going to assist us both. And then working with the CISO <laughs> introduced me to um, information security specifically, and then also um, the world of, of um, privacy on the security side. Um, and that's actually how I, I got my start. Um, Working with with them, I realized that IT is an incredibly um, fun field, and it it definitely is a field for people who like to be challenged um, daily. <laughs> and right. and your curiosity is always piqued. It's always challenged. It's um it's a really really fun, fast moving field. Um. And so under this CISO, I got involved in a lot of um, HIPAA assessments, and I just thought this privacy world is super cool. And so um, I started to focus on those privacy and policy pieces, um, governance pieces, and I just, I, I knew I never wanted to go back. It's what I wanted to do. Awesome. That's fantastic. Yeah, it, you know, it, it almost seems meant to be that you were going to be in this field. <laughs> <laughs> it, so, I wish it had happened sooner, so I will say that. Yeah, it, it took me a while to get into this field, and now that I'm here, I'm I'm here to stay. I, I really like, really enjoy the tech industry. Um, so, Lana, can you describe a time when, when you kind of questioned yourself in your role and how did you how did you overcome that oh i guess this is going to be a bit of a confession for me um every day um something happens where i i question myself and my role because privacy touches everything um and and here at avanti we have a, a huge portfolio of products and we're a global company and so Every day I learned about something I, I didn't know I didn't know or that I didn't know I didn't know enough about. <laughs> and um, so it really does um, sometimes make me feel like, man, did I pick the right field? <laughs> Is this over my death? Um, but then I remember how much I like to learn and how, how much I really prize um, challenging myself and challenging others to think about things in new and innovative ways and to apply existing concepts to, to new technologies and best practices to new technologies and how we have to uh, revise that um, quote best practice to actually make it relevant to um, the, the, the people and the users and um, the technology itself. And so that's how I um, overcome it on a daily basis. And again, I love, I'm curious and I'm, I ask a lot of questions and I'm very nosy. And so this is like perfect for me. <laughs> I get to learn every day, all the time. And that's how I deal with my, oh my gosh, is this, am I up to this challenge? I absolutely yeah. am. And so is everybody else. Yeah. It, it takes a lot of confidence to be able to say, I'm I'm not sure on this. You know, I, I don't know if this is, is right, but I'm going to keep digging until mm -hmm. till I know that this is right. So just the the confidence and the self-assuredness to be able to say, yeah, I'm not sure, but I'm going to figure it out. That's that's something that I think we don't really acknowledge you know we think well i don't know this therefore it's a failure no it's it's not it's an opportunity to learn more so um that's that's a fantastic point there shelly how about you what what scenario where you you kind of question yourself in your role and how do you how do you get over that 
Jennifer, can I piggyback off of something you and Lana had mentioned? Absolutely. It, it was wrestling with the fact that excellence and being an overachiever didn't mean I had to be perfect. Right. Yeah. Um, and so Lana, just like you, I have those questions too on a daily basis. So, um, but uh, not to be repetitive, I'll, I'll share a different story, but I just wanted to let you know that it's very common for at least um, all of our achievers to want to be at the best at what we do. And, and we, when we, you know, make a hiccup, um, just go, am I really in the right place at the right time sort of thing? But for me, my realization and my aha moment uh, of just just extending grace to myself happened in a telecom many years ago. So I'm going back, you know, a, a more than a decade. Only female executive reporting to the CIO over um, quality of telecommunication services for public and private sector as well as delivery of IT services so to our end customers. One day I came out and of a meeting with the tsunami had just happened in Taiwan, all of our hardware was late and I came out just like shell-shocked pondering should I be in this role? How do I solve these problems? We need to get this hardware. The schedule's going to slip. And I sat down at my computer and a friend sent me a study. So this tells you how much of a nerd I am. And I say that in an endearing fashion. But the study was about the human error rate that people have. So basically, human error ratio. And it said that by default, every human being has a minimum of 3% human error rate. Just for basic stuff like walking and chewing gum. I was like, oh. And then she's, and her email said, so how are you using your 3% today, Shelly? And she attached the link to the study. And I was like, 3%? And I read the study and then I finally got it. And I was like, you know, I can't foresee natural disasters. They happen. Um, my projects and on my team are going to have to just figure out a creative solution. But understanding and accept, accepting that mistakes will happen, I'll own up to them, I'll come up with the best solution and move forward, was really about how I overcame that, um, that self-doubt and realized that it's how we respond and accept the imperfections and those challenges that make us right for a role, whatever the role could be. Yeah, I I loved what you said, extending grace to myself. I'm, I'm going to uh, extend some grace to myself right now because I forgot at the beginning of the meeting to uh, do my icebreaker. So, so I'm gonna do that right now. <laughs> Um, for those of you that, that are on the call, if you can put into the chat where you're where you're from and, you know, what you do to extend grace to yourself, you know, how, how do you uh, forgive yourself for that that three percent that that we all have? I think as women, we we want to take on all of the roles and, and make everything smooth and we need to accept that that that's not our job. That's, that's not our responsibility. We have this much influence and, and this is what we need to take care of. Everything outside of that, we need to take that breath and, and understand that that's, that's outside of our influence. Um, so we need to extend that grace to ourselves. I, I love that phrase. Shelly, what are some uh, tips or advice you have to women looking to, to find their space in kind of that male dominated industry? How do you make that room for yourself? So I'm going to touch on a, a slightly sensitive topic of culture. Um, I am grateful to be uh, an American, but I wasn't born here. My original culture is very Indian. And, what, and why I raise that is it introduces a nuance 
to um, my communication style, to how I interact, how I do business, right? And in especially in, in a male-dominated field, right? The Indian culture occasionally, historically, the way I was raised is very apologetic, very, uh, um, you know, uh, community focused, right? Uh, and, and, you know, I, I apologize for practically everything. Um, it's just sort of who I am. It's how I was raised. And walking into IT and recognizing and owning that it's okay to have my cultural nuances, and that's actually a strength to the table, helped me navigate a traditionally um, male-dominated field, but with my own style, my own technique, with just my own way. So the strategies very simply were, I wasn't apologetic about my approach, right? Yes, I um, was, uh, apologize for being late to a meeting. I apologize for being rushed, right? But I didn't apologize for who I was. I didn't apologize for my strengths. And I always focused on doing the right thing. And I looked at everyone as equals, no matter what the gender was. And I looked for allies, no matter who or what their gender was. And I respected people and their cultural differences as I would want them to respect me. And when there was any form of disrespect happening, um, I pulled people aside, but I never stopped trying. My grandmother had a saying, and it translates to, if you reach for the moon and you catch a star, have you lost anything? And I always remembered that in the sense that I'll go reach for the moon, I'll go try for this, I'll go try for that, I'll volunteer here. And if I get a star and that star makes me happy, then great. And then if I need a new star, let's go look for the next one. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I love that. Um, my husband keeps telling me, you know, if, if you don't ask, then you, you you can't get it. You know, you need to you need to go out there and ask for the things that you want um, and be honest about who you are. You know, um, I think previously women tried to to make themselves more more like their male counterparts so that they could be accepted. And now I see us more being ourselves and understanding that what we bring to the table has has as much value and, and a better value than if we try to pretend to be something that we're not. So um, yeah, absolutely. That, that really resonates with me for sure. Um, Lana, how about you? What's, what are some suggestions on how to create that space in a male dominated industry? Oh. Jennifer, you took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, it's wonderful. Um, it's wonderful to know that I'm not the only one thinking this way. Um, and that that more women are coming around to just being authentic. Um, we don't have to conform to um, male or female attributes. And at the end of the day, I think one of the most important tips um, that I've employed in, in my my life is ensuring that I don't subscribe to those um, those divisions um, and that I don't promote those divisions because we have a whole breadth of experience that we are bringing with us and so do men and we we get muted um, actually maybe equally actually I would dare say at as men do when it comes to the fullness of their experience, because there are many things that you know men aren't supposed to do. They're not supposed to cry. They're not supposed to be emotional. They're not supposed to do any of these things. And and here we are. We're not supposed to be. I've I've been told I'm 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 too emotional. I've been told I'm not logical enough. I've been told I'm too logical. And so you know, the tip is just to be authentic. Um, there's it doesn't matter what industry you're going into. What matters is how you affect people um, and how you give to people because that will affect how they give back to you. And um, if you want to build a career, you have to build bridges. You can't burn them along the way. Whatever you need to do to be authentic to yourself and to be uh, a true helpmate and a teammate and a true advocate for yourself as well through the whole process of building your career is the most important 
thing, I think, um, because it touches on everything that that you do, your philosophy, your uh, your work ethic, your 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 end product of any project that you're on. It colors everything. So believing in and knowing your worth is absolutely crucial to being able to build a career in any industry. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, the the thoughts that keep you up at 2 a.m., you know, those those scenarios that run through your mind that you're like, oh, I wish I'd have handled that differently. For me, a lot of those are, are the times when I wasn't authentic to myself. You know, I tried to be something or present something that that wasn't really me. And I find the more that I'm me in in my work environment, the the better my decisions are and the more confident I am with with the work that I put out there. The other um, thing I, I've done in the tech industry, sorry, I no, just for it. to really quickly piggyback is instead of being afraid to tell people that I don't understand, I ask them to talk more about it um, and I ask them to share their knowledge with me. And if you approach it from that way, um, at least in my experience, I've received less of that. Oh, it's a woman. She doesn't know what she's doing. It's a, oh, she's interested. Okay, let me teach you about it. And then I get all the information I need and then some. The next time I don't have to ask as many questions. Absolutely. May I add to that? Yes, please. So I totally agree on the authenticity, but it's when you approach communication on your terms, right? And not quieting. So there are sometimes in some uh, scenarios where there's this uncertainty, should I say something, should I not? If you're thinking it, ask, be bold. Be, um, my mentor used to say, be um, loud and proud, but not in an abrasive way, but in your style. And that's what shines in um, in building a career and just navigating uh, the workplace, I would just also say, have a plan, right? I wanted desperately to be in project management after I learned about it in like 1909, right? <laughs> I'll, I'll leave it at X. Um, and I had to figure out how to get there from being a coder, right? So it took coming up with a plan, asking people and figuring it out. So, but now it's worth it. And I just, I, I absolutely adore it. And so I would just say, never be afraid to come up with a plan. It may not be the right one, but it's a start. Absolutely. Um, my my grandfather-in-law used to say, make a decision. It, it might not be the right decision, but but make a decision and, and start going. Because if if you don't, you're stuck. Exactly. So what what are some challenges that you personally experienced, you know, being being a woman in in this tech industry and how have you overcome those, Shelley? Having to fit into someone else's expectations for me and politely reframing those. So for example, and, and I remember the day at a company many uh, decades ago, while I reported to the CIO, I was also the only female in a meeting. And at the end of the meeting, the CIO turned to me and asked me to clean the room up for everybody. How do you respond to that, right? That's a, a interesting scenario. But I paused and took a deep breath because I will tell you, I wanted to just um, go, what, seriously? Mm -hmm. And I simply said, I'd love to help us clean up this room. Maybe we can all take a little bit of it and, and do this together. So and so, would you mind helping out? And why don't you grab this? And I just sort of turned it into a team effort and we all straightened up the room. That that's fantastic. Yeah. That knee jerk reaction of, oh no, you didn't is, you know, hard to <laughs> hard to get over, hard hard to suppress. But yeah, that's that's a fantastic way to turn that around of saying, hey everybody, he's we need to clean he's right, we need to clean this up. Let's let's take care of our own 
own mess, our own responsibility. That's fantastic. Lana, how about you? I had a similar um, setup when I was thinking about this, ab about being the only woman in a room. <laughs> That's really, really tough. And so I've been in situations where being the only woman in the room, I'm either, either not acknowledged or not even talked to. Or when I do talk, I actually, excuse me, have had the experience several times where when I do actually talk, they will turn to my male counterpart to ask the follow-up question or to uh, verify what I just said. And <laughs> that was really, really tough. And, you know, you just, uh, I, I'm actually very, very quiet and very introverted. So this panel <laughs> is, is um, you know, completely out of my element. But when things like that would would happen, I would just wait so that I could hear what their concern is. And then I would reiterate again, whatever it ne needed to be done and, and kept it about the data, about the concern, rather than taking it at personally. It isn't easy to do, especially when you are uh, traditionally less assertive. Um, I I grew up in, in a culture where women didn't take leadership roles. Um, my father was actually told uh, by other men in in my in my um, ethnicity that his daughters were too outspoken, <laughs> and, and that we, he would never get us married off because you were too outspoken. And so even with that phrasing, I, I, with that as background, I was still considerably less assertive in in the workplace um, at the start of my career than I am now. And I just, I really had to learn how to just take a deep breath. You know, I get to work with Shelly often, and she is fantastic at things that, like, she just gave an example of. And in the short time that I've worked with her, she's taught me so much about how to be graceful in those situations. And so now, you know, it's it helps me to remember to take a deep breath and find a way to redirect it in a healthy way. And so, you know, that's, I think that's one of the, the biggest challenges. And then I would say that one of the, another large challenge about women in, in any work actually is fighting against the stigma because I am a mother that um, I should be home raising my child, not in the workplace. Um, that is a really difficult challenge that I've had to face. Um, I live in a very conservative state, and so that has been um, something that I've had to actively work to help people understand that it's not a dichotomy. Being a professional and being a parent is not a dichotomy, and it is not just a woman issue or a mother issue. Fathers need to be present at home, too, and so it's a parent issue. I think those are probably my two largest challenges. Yeah. Um, Thank you for being on the panel and for talking. You're doing a fantastic job. So really appreciate everything. And yeah, you know, it's it's difficult to be looked at as, oh, well, if we give somebody this promotion, they're going to have to travel more. But she's got kids at home. Should she be out traveling? Well, that that's not that shouldn't be a part of that decision. You know, that that's up to the person on on how they can manage that um so yeah there's there's definitely views that that people take of of women that are mothers and even women that aren't mothers you know if you're a professional and and you don't have kids well why not you know should shouldn't you be having kids now you know so it it seems a lot of the time that we just can't win you know <laughs> but taking that that deep breath and going all right let's we we can address this gracefully um i love that term and uh, you know uh, being able to gracefully approach those situations and and diffuse them um so those are fantastic examples and learning from other women you know the the point of this group is addressing those concerns and and learning what other people do to in those situations so that we can emulate the things that really resonate with us. 
one of the things that I've found is having having a strong male ally in in your department or in in the industry can really help you with your your perspective and your understanding of how people approach you and and the role. Lana, do you have a, a kind of a strong male ally that that you work with to partner in these situations? You know, I'm going to going to answer that question a little bit broadly, um, Jennifer. I've been really, really fortunate in my experience throughout my entire experience to have really wonderful male allies and mentors the whole way. I don't think I've ever had a job where I didn't have a strong male ally. And I know that there are many women who probably can't say that. There are probably a lot of people who can't say that, that through the, their entire um, career, they've had a strong mentor and ally. The male allies, what set them apart for me is they really, really believed in me. They helped me grow my career. They helped develop me professionally. They mentored me, um, helped me know my material, learn my material, um, introduced me to other people that would help me um, gain the relevant uh, expertise or consult the, the correct expertise in in whatever I was researching. And um, they were willing to give me credit where credit was due. So they weren't ever afraid to say, no, Lana did this. I didn't do this. And so those two things already make me extremely fortunate. But the third thing that they did, um, that my male allies did for me that were, that was really, really important is um, they would actually defer to me um, in front of people. If I was this me and it was my job and it was my approval, it was my assessment, it was my work that was going to allow something to happen or not happen, they would defer to me. Lana is the expert. I defer to her. Lana is, um, Lana, what do you need us to do to help you? Um, how can I help you get the information you need? How can I support you? How can, how can, um, you know, I, how can I raise you up? You know, it, and it's, um, so I was extremely fortunate in in that. And then I also had, they were also very um, protective of me. And one of the things that they did that I appreciated was they didn't always do it openly. They would, um, I learned later that when they recognized, in some cases, when they recognized uh, mistreatment, they, knowing knowing the sensitivity and recognizing the sensitivity and the possible backlash to me, should they do it publicly, they were very professional and did it behind the scenes so that it preserved the professional dynamic of, of the group. When it was appropriate, they would, they would do it publicly or more openly. But um, when you're dealing with, with fairly sensitive things, sometimes it needs to be taken behind closed doors. And so um, my male allies were incredible advocates for me, and I actually still talk to all of them, um, even the ones that are retired. <laughs> That's fantastic. And yeah, having somebody that understands that that sensitivity and that balance that's needed to preserve your professional relationships with the people that you're working with is really important and vital. And and being able to find those people is, uh, you know, like like a diamond in the rough. It, it's amazing being able to identify and, and partner with those those kinds of people. So that's fantastic that you have those. Shelley, how about you? When I was thinking about what Lana was sharing, my life has had a, I, I've had my a share of uh, male allies in the workplace, um, but they may not have always been in leadership roles and they came in the most unlikely scenarios. And so all of the traits that Lana exemplified, you know, provided one-on-one -on -one coaching, um, you know, was a sounding board, um, helped navigate the politics, um, provided advice, deferred to me in meetings, you know, that happens. But I would not say that they were like, they ever had a moment where they said, Shelly, I'm your champion and I'm going to be your male ally. 
the people that were in the most, they were teammates, right? They were maybe peers. They were maybe people who I had to work with in another department that were a couple of lower levels. My junior, some were even senior when I think back to my career, and I know I'm I'm generalizing, but hindsight being 2020, what I'm realizing is my allies were my partners in goodness, as I call it, right? They're the people who help champion the work and get things done and to help advocate for me because it was the right thing to do at the right time rather than based off of gender association. Yeah, you want somebody that is genuinely in your corner and and wanting to help and promote you instead of somebody that's doing it to to check a box. So having having that trust and, you know, that that back and forth relationship, it doesn't matter if it's, you know, a, a senior level or somebody, you know, that's five levels under you having that that support and that understanding um is is what we all need so you know i i definitely encourage everybody on this call to to look around and identify those people that are supporting you you know either blatantly or subtly because there are people out there for you uh it's just sometimes hard to recognize them um jennifer yes i actually have a a quirky little thing I do to help promote people like that and let them know I recognize them. I do two things. One is around an American holiday known as Thanksgiving, where we focus on what we're grateful for. And Lana has been the recipient of this. I do a quirky little thing that I pause and I think about all my coworkers, my peers, anyone I worked with throughout the year. And I send them a little thank you note of why I'm grateful for them and working with them and just their partnership throughout the year. Because one, it's sincerely what I I feel and I want to thank people and want to recognize them. But two, it's a great reminder for me about all the goodness that I have in my life, especially at that time. Um, you know, it's the season of of reflecting and giving thanks in, in the US. Um, the second time I do that just to keep my mood more optimistic and positive because there can be so much negativity in our dailies, right? It's every month I take a pause and I go, who's helped me this month? And I send them a quick note thanking them for their help and and recognizing the help that they've given me. I know it's just one person and it's only once a month, but it helps them know that I see them despite no matter what um, gender association they might have, as well as um, if it's someone who's really notable, who's gone above and beyond, I might even forward that email or write an email directly to their manager, letting their manager know how awesome they are just to really spread the goodness. So those are some ways that I've helped build partnership and in, in across a company um, and just build that team of teammates and allies and, and peers. I love that. Yeah, sometimes we get so just focused on our day, day-to-day work and, you know, we, we never pick our heads up and look around and see what's impacting what we do. So taking that time to consciously look for the good and, you know, the people that are there and supporting us and recognizing that it lifts your mood, too. I mean, it's it's great to to recognize them and, and acknowledge them. And when I've received those, I feel fantastic. But, you know, it it also helps you recognize that, hey, we're not alone out here. We've got a lot of people that are helping us do this day to day. That's that's fantastic. I love that. Um. So, Shelly, you talked about kind of recognizing and and promoting other people around you. How do you do that for yourself? So, I I feel like I'm on the moment of truth or dare. (laughs) (laughs) It's a hard one. I I know it doesn't uh, appear that way, but I am naturally an introvert too, right? Um, And... I found myself many years ago, uh, almost 10 now, um, 
successfully having led a $247 million transformational effort with 330 people reporting to me. That's a huge accomplishment on by any standard, but the fact that we ended like three months early and 1% under budget was huge. That that was like, I, I was like pinching myself going, is this real? And did this really happen? And, and I don't share that story to um, say how great I am, because seriously, I'm not. Um, but what I share is the story that came out of it. We meant to celebrate it, and I was being recognized for the accomplishment at the organization. And I said, I don't deserve it. It was the team, right? And the the person I reported to um, at the time, she was uh, an SVP over the division. She said, Shelly, if you do not learn to stand up and take a bow now, you never will. You have done amazing work in pulling together these people and this team be loud and proud and that has stuck with me and so when we talk about um ensuring we i personally receive the credit we deserve is yes i recognize my team and their contribution and give them the kudos but i also um let people know my part in pulling them together, my part in supporting them. Um, and even if it's one-on-one -on -one with my leadership, just saying, hey, just wanted you to know, this is how I enabled this work, right? Um, when I'm working as an individual contributor, I'll, because I run projects day-to-day -day on my own as well, right? Um, and I'll say, I'm the PM and I'm proud of it, right? It, it's just, it's accepting that we all have an equal seat at the table. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, when when you're in charge of a team that does such amazing work, you want to put the focus on the team because they they work their butts off to to get to that level. But you, we need to remember that we're part of that team, too. Um, so we we need to to embrace the fact that we've done this work too that's that's a fantastic point lana how about you what are what are some of the things that you do to promote yourself you know i really have a hard time promoting myself it's it's one of the hardest things for me to do um what drove it home for me on on being able to promote myself and just taking taking the praise and the compliment and and actually telling people, you know, I did this. I I helped lead this. I did this particular task of work is actually when um, I have a 12 year old at home and I was telling her to be proud. I was praising her for something she did and she completely shrank back from it. And that's when I realized if I'm not loud and proud about my accomplishments, how do I expect her to be? If I'm not exemplifying that for her, how do I tell her that it's important? Because it obviously isn't important to me if I can't do it, right? And it's unfortunate that it's taken me so long <laughs> to be able to toot my own horn, but now I am able to say, hey, you know what? We did this project and it was, these were the difficult pieces and this is what I did to to help smooth the way. This, these are the roadblocks I helped address. These are um, the improvements that we made. Um, so it's getting easier for me, but it's hard for me to toot my own horn. I really have to work. <laughs> um, I don't have any problem tooting other people's horns, um, but I, it is it is hard for me. I have to admit. Yeah, I, I, I think I'm in that same boat. You know, I find it really easy to shine the light on other people because I see what they're doing and, and think it's amazing. And when people shine that light on me, I kind of go try to redirect it. You know, well, yeah, yeah. I, I was part of this team and they did this stuff, too. So let's let's look over here. But as a parent, I find a lot of the the hard lessons that I learn about how I want to be. I find mirrored in my children, you know, so I, I want them to be strong and confident and outgoing. But if I don't exemplify that for them, how are they going to to see how to follow that path? So, yeah. um, 
yeah, a, a lot of uh, the lessons that I learn on how I want to be, I take from how how I want to mirror or exemplify for for my kids. So, Lana, outside of Avanti, are there other programs or communities that you're a part of to to help you get that knowledge in the industry and and elevate your role? So when I thought about this, I actually thought about it in a slightly different way. Um, for me, I love, I love my job. I love the field of privacy. I think it is vital and it is important. And, and it's kind of, it's not kind of, it is also a kind of a social justice cause <laughs> for me. And so what I'm actually focusing on outside of the industry to, is, is to elevate privacy as a whole. Um, I do a lot of um, community outreach with kids and with schools. I participate in career days. I, I partici participate in Ask Me Anything um, and, and career, fo career forums and, and things like that and, and just do education on privacy as a whole because um, it's really difficult to change adult behavior with with privacy we're a lot more stuck in our ways I guess <laughs> and kids are teach so an old malleable. Job, new trick. <laughs> well you can it just takes a lot of work <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know <laughs> I, 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 it takes a lot of work for me to change myself right I'm an, I'm I'm old um <laughs> so um I spend a lot of time actually with kids and and educating kids on on privacy and what it means and and how they can have safer habits um, and so that they they can uh, protect themselves appropriately. Um, and it's wonderful to see that this uh, there's a lot of change happening with with the younger generation and it's it's so exciting. It's wonderful. The breath of fresh air is amazing. And so um, that's where I spend most of my non avanti time. That's fantastic. And yeah, you know, being able to to share that knowledge that you've gleaned through through your work with people outside of your work environment really kind of uh, gives you a, a warm fuzzy that, hey, I'm, I'm doing work that impacts a lot more than just just my job. So that's mm -hmm. that's fantastic that you have that opportunity. Shelly, how about you? Are there other organizations or projects that you're part of outside of Avanti? Um, the good thing about project management is it applies to every industry, even outside of tech. Um, so I spend a lot of time just volunteering for nonprofits in like a PM role, <laughs> quite literally. So I, I bring my trade to basic nonprofits. Like there's um, one where um, it's a social justice cause focused on trying to end human trafficking. And so they needed someone to help project manage building a website for them. I don't know how to build a website. Well, I could back in the day, but I know how to run a project. So <laughs> help them get quotes, did all that, right? Um, the other thing that I do besides just using um, my skills in the non profit world is I teach just like Lana. I love to share what I've learned so people don't have to repeat the, the hard lessons that I learned because I learned the hard way. Um, and so I teach classes and, and really love learning from my students about how things should be done differently. And so while I'm teaching them what I know, their questions challenge me to think about things differently. And we brainstorm to a better way of doing things. And that's what I love about just giving back in the community and teaching and sharing. Because when I hear the different points of view, I learn to, to tune my craft to be better, just kind of like Lana had said. Yeah, I think being open to to hearing those challenging questions and thoughts and ideas really drive what you do every day. You know, if you're if you're not open to other points of view, you again, you really can't proceed forward in in what you're doing. So, um, 
And those different points of view can open up paths and directions that you had no idea you wanted to explore. Um, so that's that's fantastic. And doing it in the community with, you know, the youth, I find that they have such a larger world view than than I did at their age. It's fantastic to see and, and understand where they're coming from. So what kinds of pressure, you know, looking at that work life balance that we all try to maintain, but always seem to miss somehow. <laughs> um, what what kinds of pressure do you feel to maintain a work life balance? You know, is it coming from the home? Is it coming from the office? Is it coming from yourself? Um, Lana, can you speak to that a little bit? Oh, I think everyone's worst critic is themselves, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I know that the pressures I feel related to work-life balance primarily start with me. Um, I know I have felt and I've uh, that I can't step back um, from work and have those appropriate healthy boundaries because, you know, I'm I'm a woman and I can't appear, you know, weak or less attentive or less dedicated than my male counterparts, and and that's just silliness. Um, I have learned the very hard way um, that implementing and maintaining appropriate boundaries is actually a, a sign of strength. Um, healthy boundaries really translates into um, the strongest supporting statement you can make about your self-discipline, about your, your competence and your knowledge and your competence and your ability. Um, it's a testament to, to your ability to actually work efficiently. Um, the healthy boundaries just aren't beneficial to me. It, it allows my company, it allows anybody I'm interacting with um, to also benefit from, from my performance when I'm uh, at my peak, especially during um, you know periods of increased demand, because I'm coming from a full reservoir. I'm not completely burnt out. I'm not just dragging myself out of bed like I just did 16 hours. <laughs> you know, I've been there, I've done that um, not too long ago, actually. Um, my son came to me and he said, mom, do I need to put time on your work calendar to see you? And I was like, like, I just stopped. I almost wanted to start crying. I was like, my son is saying this to me. And then I stepped back and I realized I was working seven days a week, um, 10 to 12 to 16 hours a day because I needed to get all of these things done. And I just thought, really? Um, so it really was at that point in time, me establishing healthy boundaries, um, because even at the time, even my boss was saying, you got to step away. And I was like, I got to get this done. I got to get this done. And so some of it is a lot of it is me taking responsibility for my health and, and, um, disciplining myself to prioritize balance in all areas. Um, it, and work-life balance isn't just about time away. It's about making the time to eat healthy, to get your sleep, to get some exercise, to have some downtime and exercise self-care. It's it's all kinds of things that you have to employ to actually balance work and life. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of discipline and a lot of intent. Absolutely. Yeah, that that intent to to stay disciplined and to maintain that that balance is is a struggle for sure. Um, so for for those of you that are listening, if you can put into the chat, what are some ways that you guys maintain that work life balance? You know, how do you make sure that you maintain a reservoir for yourself so that you're not running on empty all the time or or can you do that? Um, Shelly, what are what are some of the ways that you maintain that life balance, work life balance? So I should just wait for the chat to fill up and read that, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I'm still trying. <laughs> um, so the the short answer is I too, Lana, had to to wrestle with that same question, especially um, with the start of the pandemic and going 100% remote, right? Because it was like I was always working in the beginning. And it was really 
allowing myself and giving myself permission to step away, uh, being intentional to um, disconnect. So yes, there are days of hiccups where, you know, um, there for a specific period, there might be excessive time of work, but, you know, uh, closing my computers, not starting my computer or looking at my email before, um, you know, 6 a.m. Pacific, because I'm in uh, the West Coast and 6 a.m. is awfully early, right? <laughs> um, at least for me. Yeah. And um, so the pressure originally was always be on, always be there, always be present, always take care of my team, be there for them. But as Lana mentioned, as my reserves started getting depleted at the start of the pandemic, I wasn't able to be there for them. I wasn't able to support them. And I was getting, um, you know, I, I was just getting agitated and I was getting fussy, like, you know, like a kid that needed a nap. <laughs> and so then it, it really forced me to take a step back, examine my uh, work-life balance uh, practices. And um, some days they're better than others. Some days they're not, but also being comfortable with it's good enough. Um, mm -hmm. One of my favorite quotes is uh, quality is what you do when no one is looking, followed by the second quote, which is 80% uh, is fine. It will be okay. And what that means is I don't have to get it to 100% perfect. I can get it to the best I can for the time that I have and then just move on and being okay with that. And I really find that by, by really extending grace to myself, taking care of my own self-care, um, time alone, reading a book, going for a walk, playing with my dogs, whatever it is, has really made me more present to my family, right? To be able to hear them, to my friends, um, to my peers. Like if they're having a rough day, I can hear the change in their voice now where I can go, hey, is something going on? Do you wanna talk about it? If it's in an appropriate setting to pull them aside one-on-one, -on -one, right? Um, but before when I was just running full throttle, I don't think I could have done that. And that's what work by life balance has brought me. It has brought me the ability to be more present. And that's what I love. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the things as as we get further into leadership, we we want to work more and control more and, and own more. But one of the things we need to realize is that the people on our team and the people observing us, if they see us working 12, 16 hour days, seven days a week, they're going to be like, well, we, we probably need to do that too. So you're setting that example. And if you're feeling burnt out, probably the other people on your team are too. So we need to, to really be cognizant of that, um, that the, the better we maintain that example of a work-life balance, the better the more we can help others to see the need and, and the benefit of doing that as well. Um, so is it okay if I add just two absolutely little things that I do? Um, work life balance. I think it really is like you were saying the, the responsibility of of your leaders to set the example. Um, what I do with my team very intentionally is I ensure that we are cross trained. Um, I've worked on teams before where everyone was very siloed and they owned their work and they did not let it go and they didn't share their knowledge. And if they left, it would leave with them. Um, so I am adamant about cross training because part of the reason people can't do the work life balance is because they feel like if they take time away, um, it's all going to fall apart because they're the only one who does their job. And then they're afraid to take time off and they're afraid to even just leave for a couple hours and, and practice self-care. And so um, cross-training is crucial on my team. It, it's a must. Um, it's And it allows them to actually say, I need 
to take time away and I know that everything's not going to fall apart because I can just ask so-and-so to support me and I don't need to worry about whether or not they know how to do it. I don't need to train them before I go. We're just all on the same page and can move forward as a team. And um, the other thing I encourage them to do is to turn their phone off. Turn it off. When you are done for the day, turn it off. And if I'm emailing you off of hours, do not respond to me. If it is urgent, I will find a way to to contact you. If I'm working and you're you're not working or because I have to catch it because I just came back from from holiday, does not mean that you need to respond to me on Sunday night at eight o'clock when I'm looking at my calendar, trying to understand what I'm coming back to. Um, if you need, I respect their time. I absolutely make sure that they know. Um, if I have to pull them into something later, I, I make sure I say, I ask them if, if they are available for it um, so that they can feel like they actually own their time and I'm not usurping their personal time. It, that, that boundary of respect is, is really important on a leadership level, I think. Extremely cognizant of it on my part. And it's also, so from a leadership level, it's watching. Um, I have some amazing, gifted, talented individuals who just are passionate about their work. And when I see them not t it, it, exemplifying work-life balance, and, and I've set the expectation that that is our goal, because to me, that is the goal, right? I want people to bring um, their best, however their best is defined, because it's on a personal level. But if I see them going above and beyond, and it's like after hours for them, and it's let's say they're in uh, um, uh, EMEA, so the British time zone as an example, and it's 10 p.m. and they're on a call, I'll politely one-on-one -on -one, um, during a one-on-one -on -one or via Teams one-on-one -on -one directly to them say, hey, I appreciate your dedication, but please, um, we'll record the call. You can get caught up and I'll, I'll sync up with you offline. It, it's okay. I give people um, permission to step away and I set the expectation that I want them to step away and then I follow up on it. Um, one time it was a crunch time for a project and most of my team was working and it was a Friday at like oh dark hour on the Pacific and most are on the East Coast and, and I said I see you all still working. I don't know if I should feel sad that no one listens to me and doesn't practice work-life balance, but I'm going to log off and I hope you log off too. And I use a little emoji and a little cartoon mm -hmm. to make it funny, right? I use little things like that and I'm present and I watch and I recognize, but on the flip side, when I see someone who has to go above and beyond for a specific reason, I will ask them, how do we balance this out? What can I do to ensure that you're not over allocated going forward? It's have, being open to have that healthy dialogue. Like, do you have too much on your plate? Um, is this just, you know, one week, two weeks? Do we need to, to you know, get some help in this effort? And, and it's not being afraid to treat emotional, physical, mental well-being whole person well-being, as I call it, as a priority, because when a whole person is well, the work is just awesome. Oh, right. Absolutely. And I think, you know, it, it it's it, it's the whole package. Leadership needs to be able to say, look, we we as a company strive for a, a good work life balance and we want our employees to exemplify that. And, and here's the way we're doing that. But if that leader doesn't also practice having a good work-life balance, it's hard to get that message across. So, you know, being able to respect your own boundaries and say, this is when I'm working, this is when I'm not, that, that shows everybody in the company that you know, as as a leadership, we really mean it. We we really want you to have that work life balance because we want to have that work life balance. That's fantastic. So, final question, because because we got just a couple minutes left, um, and and I want people to put in the chat as well and answer it there. What are what what's one thing that you do 
to practice uh, self-care, you know, when, when you're at the end of the day or in the middle of your day and you're like, this is it, this is my level, I've reached it. How, how do you practice that self-care to recharge your batteries? Lana, go ahead and we'll, we'll start with you. Oh man. Um, <laughs> well, I actually schedule Maybe, maybe I shouldn't say this, but I do. I actually schedule one-on-one -on -one time with myself and I honor it. That's fantastic. I make sure <laughs> I I make sure that I schedule nothing above it or beside it or over it or I, I honor my one-on-one -on -one time with myself now. I have to because we're a global organization and because I have to address issues some, as they come up because they are time sensitive. It really, I, I don't have... I don't have the luxury of, of imposing a specific time uh, work work schedule on myself. So when I have that one-on-one -on -one time with myself, or I also do one-on-ones with with my children, and then even with I know it sounds silly, but with my partner on a daily basis, where I remind myself to spend 30 minutes with them, or spend you know remember to to text them or call them or whatever, because that's how I recharge my batteries. Um, and with my one-on-one -on -one time, I I do actually schedule a very long one-on-one -on -one time because I fa recently found a new hobby and I make time to do that new hobby every day. <laughs> so that's that's paramount, absolutely paramount. I don't infringe anymore on my one-on-one -on -one time. That's fantastic. How about you, Shelley? So Lana, I'm going to. Um borrow the one-on-one -on -one time idea. I love it. Right? <laughs> yeah. I think it's awesome. For me, it is, I, I'm, I meditate. I start my day in meditation and focus time, and then I end it that way. And that's my one, you know, my go-to, right? Excellent. Yeah. Finding ways to just kind of center yourself in the moment. Definitely. Yeah.